Welcome to College Football Live, presented by Dr. Pepper. What's up, y'all? Welcome to College Football Live. Peter Burns, Emmanuel Acho, Jonathan Vilma. I missed you, boys. It's been a while. Uh, it's been too long, PB. I know, way too long. All right, enough beat around the bush because we had a lot of stuff to get into, including how about some coaching hires. Ready for this? Tis the season, right? Two more big ones this week. Steve Adagio going to be coaching his some dudes out at Fort Collins. Took the Colorado State job earlier this week. And how about Willie Taggart? One, two, three, fourth school in five years. He's named as the head coach down in Boca, taking over for Lane Kiffin over at FAU. So, gentlemen, Bill, let's start with you right here. Do you like the idea, a quote-unquote retread versus an up-and-coming coordinator? No, I don't like the idea. When you look at the history right now, the current history, you're talking about Fuente, who came from a group of five. Bronco Mendenhall came from a group of five. Matt Rule came from a group of five. P.J. Fleck came from a group of five. Everything is telling you that these young coaches, these quote-unquote unproven young coaches in a group of five, they are the ones that are setting the standard right now, whether it's because they work harder, relate to the players better. I don't know what it is, but the fact is the old coaches aren't getting it done. Go with the young, unproven guys. They will get the job done for you. They're hungry. Yeah, to me, it's not one size fits all. It's not one shoe fits all. It's it depends on the coach and it depends on the situation. I look at a guy like Taggart and he hasn't really had much success out of late. Everybody knows what he did early on in his career at South Florida. Well, we say early on, it was truly just three or so years ago. But to me, the, the Taggart hire is a little surprising. Whereas Adazio, seven and six, seven and six, six and six at Boston College, he's kind of a perennial 500 type of coach. So. And that also, it, it can be, to me, perceived as a lazy hire. It, that's when I do agree with Vilma. Maybe you do go get a younger coach, but here's the risk. For all of these prominent coaches that JV named, you also have the coordinators who become head coaches who struggle. And you know JV right now, even at your alma mater with Miami and Manny Diaz, he's having a learning curve that I think some of the other coaches that have been head coaches don't have to have. Yeah, Acho, and that's a, I, I believe we're agreeing, and you're taking it from a different perspective. That's exactly what I'm saying, that it's not necessarily the, the hot defensive coordinator or the hot offensive coordinator from a Power 5 school you go hire. Hire the team, the coach that has experience in the group of five. He's already yep. taken his lumps. He's already had his mistakes. So then now you bring him up to the Power 5. Those are the ones right now that are producing. They have good yep. talent, good schemes, good programs. Yeah, because well, guys, here's what we do know. Real quick, PB, what I don't like is kind of the recycled hire. It's, oh, this guy was a big name. Surely he'll be able to come produce when, keep in mind, he didn't produce it where he was at for a reason. <laughs> so why not just take blind faith and try to pick a former big name out of hat and hope for the best? Uh, Acho, that happens a lot in the NFL, but there's a question on how, what's the best way to do it in the collegiate level. And how about for USF? Because they go and go snatch Jeff Scott out of Clemson. And think about this, guys. Let's take a look at the continuity that Clemson has had on this coaching staff because it's nothing short of fantastic, right? Dabo's been there <laughs> since 08. Jeff Scott, okay, been there since 08 as well on staff. Elliot Venables, I mean, all of these guys there since 2011. So, Acho, let's start with there. This has really hurt Alabama in the past, the staff turnover. Will this affect Clemson going forward? Well, first and foremost, that's a phenomenal job by Dabo Sweeney to keep that continuity. Imagine the culture he must have built for not only coaches in one of the hardest professions to want to stay somewhere that long in lesser than roles. Now, to your question, yes, it will hurt. And this is the next step in elite coaching that I think Dabo will make and will have to make is how good can you be? when you're losing coaches year in and year out. Saban has said, and I've talked to people that have played for Saban and worked for Saban, and they'll say he knows coaches are coming through to try to get the next job. Imagine how hard that is. I'm interested to see what Dabo can do. Yeah, I like it, Acho. What the, let's first commend Dabo for being able to keep his coaching staff for so long. And you al it also speaks to the culture and, and – a testament to him and the culture he's created because you frankly have coaches that have valued the culture that he's created over money. Now, mm -hmm. there obviously comes a point, there's a tipping point, and I believe now is where we're going to start to see that Clemson can't continue to give raises to these assistant coaches to keep them there. What's going to happen is other schools are now looking at Clemson and the coaching staff and saying, all right, 
the market is such where we can offer more than what Clemson can offer to keep you as an assistant. We know you love it there, but at some point, money talks, and that's the tipping point right now that Dabble's going to see over the next two, three, five years where coaches, they're going to have to say, look, financially, I have to take this job. I have to take this opportunity. Now, with that being said, if it's a slow turnover for Dabo, I seriously don't see much of a drop-off because, again, it's not just the X's and O's. It's the culture he's created there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Fans I mean, need I, to I, understand. Go ahead, PB. No, no, no. I was going to say, just when you look at it, too, uh, Ed Ogeron is trying to create that as well, too, keeping Dave Aranda there as long as he can. Joe Brady mm-hmm. still ends me. And I think he's as comfortable with that staff. And I think that's one of the reasons why Alabama had their issues last year. And it make it even worse here, guys, soon, because I want to get into this, Acho, because right now, Lane Kiffin's putting together his staff over at Ole Miss. Just got hired at Oxford. And part of it is trying to get some Bama guys on that coaching staff, including maybe Scott Cochran, his strength and conditioning coach that he worked with. So I don't know if you guys had a chance to watch it, but the Saban Belichick HBO special is fantastic because he talks about this specifically. Saban says to Belichick, when these guys get those jobs, in most cases, you help them. They have a hard time understanding why they can't take your people. I'm going to help you get a job so that you can take what I've tried to build here and destroy the continuity of what I had. It's amazing how some of the assistants don't understand why that's not a good thing. Now, that came on the heels of Saban taking the job at Michigan State, guys, and not taking any of the guys that were on Belichick staff at the Browns when they coached together. So, Vilma, is that right or wrong if Lane Kiffin or anyone's trying to poach other coaches? Well, it, it's twofold. It's a layered question because you, you look and say – First, what is the relationship between Lane Kiffin and Nick Saban in this example before Lane Kiffin was hired by Nick Saban? If they were friends, if they were buddies, if they hung out together off the, off the field or whatever their situation was, and then he brings them onto his staff, and then now they have a relationship, a working relationship, and an off-the-field relationship as friends, then I understand why he's saying it's not right to do that to your friend. If this was a business relationship, Nick Saban didn't know Lane Kiffin before he hired him, only knew of him, only realized how good his offense would be if he brought him on. Then Lane Kiffin comes on. He does exactly what you asked him to do and what you're paying him for, and then he leaves. There was no goodbye, no hugs, no friendship. So then it's business for Lane Kiffin. He's doing exactly what any other coach would do and go out and find the best play, excuse me, the best coaches for his coaching staff. So I can see it both ways. If they weren't friends, it's strictly business. There's nothing wrong with that here's my thing if I'm Nick Saban why would I care because what we have to realize Nick Saban he has a secret ingredient that everybody doesn't have we're coming off the heels of Thanksgiving I tried to borrow my friend's collard green recipe but I made it and I tell you right now it didn't taste the same because I don't know the secret ingredient it's the same thing with Nick Saban all of his assistants leave and they try to duplicate the Saban way well the Saban way it doesn't work for everybody else in the same manner that it worked for Saban just like Bill Belichick you have guys like Eric Mangini who have left guys like Uh, Matt Patricia, who has left, now coach for the Lions. Mm. Even guys like Mike Vrabel, he's turning things around for the Titans. Let's divert away from the NFL. But what I'm saying is, if I'm Nick Saban, it doesn't even matter because they don't have the secret sauce anyway. Yeah, but Acho, Acho, you're saying that. But at that point, the last three times that uh, Alabama has faced a top 25 team, They've had goose egg. They haven't won any of these games. And so you start thinking, okay, maybe it does. Maybe that secret ingredient is no longer there and everyone's catching up with them because of the coaching turnover. But to me, uh, to me, I think of it, PB and, and Vilma, is it's more of parity in college football. I think now at this point, the players across the board are better. To, it's not as much as, oh, well, they have this strength coach. And because they got Alabama strength coach, all of a sudden these players are exponentially stronger and now they can compete with Alabama. No. But what it is is there's a plethora of schemes now across the landscape of college football. There's a plethora of talent now across the landscape of college football, and that has led to more parity, more than somebody poaching a coach. There are a lot of talented coaches around. Yeah, I, I agree with you to an extent, Nacho. I don't believe there's as much parity in college football just yet. Maybe among the top teams, the top five teams, not across uh, all of college football. And one aspect we're not thinking of is the energy time spent 
on Nick Saban having to go and find a, a new hire that's yeah. going to be a good fit. So remember, Nick Saban spends countless, countless hours, what, recruiting, looking at talent. He goes over his schemes defensively. We know he's a defensive guru. So that time taken away is what he has to now use to go and find a new coach or a new strength coach, whoever it is. Mm. That's that time away from him winning championships. That's the way he views it. So I can understand where he's saying the labor I have to put, it's so labor intensive to find the right guy, the right fit, only for you to poach him. That that's taxing. I understand where he's coming from, but again, it's a business. Yeah, and listen, and the only parody they have is obviously that color green recipe, Acho, that you can't put together. So we need to get that together. All right, uh, coming up tonight, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern ESPN, the app, 29th annual Home Depot College Football Award Show from where Acho is at, College Football Hall of Fame in the ATL. Fowler hosting with Corso, Herb Street, Desmond, Rinaldi, and Maria Taylor. Coming up to play or not to play, A.J. Dillon skipping the bowl game. Jonathan Taylor said he's going to go. Who made the right call? We'll tell you next. Now for today's Wendy's Weekend Watch. One game on the schedule this week, and it's a good one. Army-Navy game, all eyes, going to be on Navy QB Malcolm Perry. Senior signal caller, phenomenal season. Only QB to throw for 1,000 yards and rush for 1,500 yards. And he doesn't throw it a ton. His 82 total QBR still ranks ninth in FBS this season. All right, so he's going to play in a game. A.J. Dillon, he's done. He's skipping his senior season. And in fact, he's skipping Boston College Bowl game, the Birmingham Bowl against Cincinnati on January the 2nd. Now, he's BC's all-time leading rusher, guys, over 4,000 yards. So, Acho. Is this the right move? Another big-time player saying, I ain't playing in the bowl game, boys. Absolutely, it's the right move. Without a doubt, unequivocally, there's no other way that I can state just how right a move it is. And it's the right move because A.J. Dillon has carried the ball 845 times in his college career. You want to know what he has to show for it? A seven-win season, a seven-win season, and thus far a six-win season. So am I mad at A.J. Dillon for wanting to skip a game against Cincinnati where he has nothing left to prove? Not at all. I love it, Otto, <clears throat> and I agree with you. I, I don't have any issue with players skipping a bowl game. Only issue I have is if they handle it the right way. What I mean by that, if you are at the end of the season, you tell coach, you tell your players, hey, I'm going to have a discussion with my family, the people closest to me, about whether I should play in this bowl game or not as I prepare for the NFL. You come back, hey, I decided, my family decided, whatever it is that we are not or I'm not going to play in this bowl game. Guys, thank you for everything you've done. I appreciate it. And then you move on. And that's as businesslike as you can. You still appreciate your teammates. You appreciate the coaches, but if you handle it well, I have no issues with it. Zero. Yeah, at all. it's upfront it. and personal. Well, like we get it, right? It's a business, but is it just a running back situation? Are you, or this is across the board, no matter what position you may play, you're okay with these guys sitting out? PB, I like it across the board because li listen, the coaches. And the money that's being made, we all know how much money coaches are getting paid and how much is being made off these players. And until they enact some sort of likeness that we're waiting for the NCAA to clarify when they come back from the holidays, I like that they're thinking about their futures. They're thinking about the business side of the game, which, frankly, has not been done for 10, 15 years. And I'm never going to bash someone for going out and trying to pros prosper and gain financially to better themselves and to better their families. Yeah, to Vilma's point, think about how much money is changing hands during bowl games. Head coaches getting bonuses, coordinators getting bonuses, position coaches getting bonuses, athletic directors, universities, they're profiting. Well, during this game of monetary musical chairs, you want to know the player who's left, the guy who's left out is the athlete themselves. So go chase your money. You've served, you've worked, you've done all you can for year after year in college. Now it's time to protect yourself, protect your health. And if there's a lot of money on the line and just a, a bowl game that to you may not mean as much to that particular athlete, go chase your dream. It's kind of interesting yeah, think how we've come full Bernsey. circle, right? Well, yeah, think about ahead. this. Imagine if A.J. Dillon got hurt and we said, mm. and he's, it's now season-ending, career-ending injury. What are we going to do? Say, oh, man, tough luck. No one's going to hand him any money. No one's going to say, here's a check for what you would have made as a first-round running back and, mm. and one rookie of the year. It's not happening. Now, I think we all agree with it on this type of bowl game, but all of a sudden, if someone says, hey, I'm not playing in the college football playoff because of that, let's have a revisit of this whole entire conversation. All right, I think I know what happens, but you never know, right? Saturday night, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, ESPN, 85th Annual Heisman Trophy Ceremony from New York City. Joe Burrow, Jalen Hurts, Justin Fields, or his teammate Chase Young, and that Heisman Trophy Ceremony presented by Nissan.
You know who's not going to be there? This guy. It breaks my heart. Jonathan Taylor, seventh player in FBS history to rush for 6,000 yards in his career. And, guys, he did it in just three seasons. Now, we will get to see him suit up in the Rose Bowl versus Oregon, but he is not one of those Heisman finalists and probably deserved an invite because look at this season compared to other notable Heisman winners like Bo and Herschel and fellow Badger Ron Dane. The numbers are better in many different ways. So when it comes down to it, Villa, did the voters snub Jonathan Taylor this year? Oh, of course they snubbed it. How can you tell me a guy as prolific as he's been the past three seasons is not voted top four and invited into New York? That's crazy to me. What he's done, any college football fan that sat and watched these games and watched Jonathan Taylor run the football knew that he was a special talent and for them to ignore him has now basically proven what the Heisman is. It's a popularity contest. That's all it is. And I can't stand it because he deserved to be there. And frankly, I'm glad that he's giving us one more game. I'm excited about it because I love watching him run the football. Jonathan Taylor, you got snubbed, man. It's a, it's a disappointment. JV, you're exactly right. How Jonathan Taylor is in there is beyond me. I mean, you look at a guy like Chase Young, and I'm a defensive player, and Chase Young is an absolute stud. But if Ohio State doesn't have Chase Young, they're still probably sitting at 13-0. and If Wisconsin doesn't have Jonathan Taylor, mm. I don't even know how many games they would have won all season. Again, 6,000 career yards over the course of three seasons. If you just want to talk about this season, 21 touchdowns. Then he proved he could do it catching the ball with five touchdowns out the backfield. What can't this man do? I don't get it at all. How do you leave him out? Well, overall, guys, and you take a look at it, too, he was eligible for every single game. That's not something that Chase Young could have said. Remember, Young had to sit out the two games for a complete incident that he at least was forthcoming about. So I thought maybe that should count a little bit. Is it kind of crazy to you, last quick question on here, Acho, that jo uh, Joe Burrow's going to win this thing hands down, we believe, because 40 touchdowns, only one interception for Justin Fields. Could this thing be a race? Well, I don't think it'll be a race, mainly because of all the hype Joe Burrow has and what Joe, Joe Burrow did at LSU. We haven't seen done at LSU in quite some time, if not ever. What Justin Fields did at Ohio State, we kind of saw Dwayne Haskins do it last year with Dwayne Haskins having 50 passing touchdowns. So I think Justin Fields lost a little bit of that luster in that regard. But think about this. With Justin Fields' 40 touchdowns and one interception, he also had 10 rushing. He's second nationally in total touchdowns and best nationally in interceptions. So Justin Fields would run away with it any other year. Yeah, I'm just going to pass it right back on over you, Burnsy. Uh, Burrow wins it. There's nothing to talk about. <laughs> well, I was going to say, listen, that's, uh, that's fine with me. He'll be uh, celebrated. I'm sure that he'll have a, uh, a trophy out there in front of Tiger Stadium, especially if they can win this year with a title. All right, we got a lot more coming up on at College Football Live. And here's a quick look at this year's ROTC Senior of the Year Award presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. Congratulations to Cadet Charles Bloom of the North Carolina State University Air Force ROTC, Cadet Nicole Butler of the Notre Dame Army ROTC, and Midshipman Jennifer Philbrown with the University of Florida Marine ROTC on being named the Navy Federal Credit Union ROTC Seniors of the Year. Congrats, y'all. That was awesome. You know what's awesome? Seeing this. Hey, moves like Jagger. How about Mac Brown get it done? But did he have the best looks first like year hurts. of any coach? We'll tell you. Oh, no. <laughs> Ow. Ow. Kelly like football hurts. live. Record. 45 passing touchdowns beats Trevor Lawrence over there at Clemson for the freshman record. I mean, everything about Mac Brown and what he's done to change the culture <laughs> of that team, to change the program, has been on the up and up. And, oh, by the way, he's recruiting pretty damn well, too. So watch out, ACC. Mac Brown's coming. Yeah, shout out to Kansas State head coach first and foremost because he did some big things. Chris Kleiman over there upsetting Iowa State, beating Oklahoma and throwing college football in chaos. But enough about that. Let's get to my guy, Mac Brown, and everything he did. I understand he had some losses. I don't care about those losses because it's five combined losses by 22 points. Am I biased? Yes, I'm biased. Do I care? Not at all. Mac Brown is that man. There's a reason he's in the College Football Hall of Fame. I'm sure he might have a statue somewhere in this room I'm sitting in. If not, he deserves one because what he did at UNC, phenomenal. I asked him this past weekend. I said, Mac, you won a national title at Texas. We went to another national title when I was there with you at Texas what are you most proud of? 
He said, honestly, this season at North Carolina. He said, because this season I've had the most fun, and I remember what it feels like to win. So Mac Brown, he for sure had the best season. Uh, and you guys miss it. It is a UNC coach, but it's UNCC, UNC Charlotte. How about Will Healy? Did you guys not see this? My man is right here, first year taking over this program. <laughs> He's got right, club Bernie. lit. He's got the mascot head. It. He's got the dad bod going on. How can you not give it to him for the first year? Look at that. He okay. moves better than Brown. <laughs> Bernie, if you're talking about party of the year by a head coach, he is definitely party of the year. If you're talking about someone I want to take to Vegas with me, he's definitely the one. I'm taking to Vegas with me. <laughs> Uh, by the way, also a shout out to Eli Drinkwitz. Remember, App State, he took that yes. over for 12 1, looking uh, in 12 1 this season, looking to see if, uh, yeah, he got that money right there, that Acho type money at Mizzou. Hey, thanks for watching a little college football live today.